Hey, deserving listeners, it's just me today. So I was teaching class a couple of days ago, and I was talking with my students, and a couple uh, times the students would say a word that was a sort of pet peeve of mine. Like one student used the word uh, committed suicide, for example. You know, she was like, oh, well, so-and-so committed suicide. And I just sort of cataloged it away. I didn't respond right then because I thought, you know, why why be pedantic in this moment? Uh, you know, it's it's week two of the quarter. These are first quarter students. I don't want to, I don't want to cause you know more insecurity and more anxiety for the already super um, anxious first quarter students. So I didn't say anything. But then later in the class meeting, our class meetings are three hours long, so there's a lot of opportunities for things like this to happen. But later in the class meeting, another student said the word codependent. They were saying, "Oh, the so and so is very codependent," and. I, you know, you know, responded to what they were saying. And then, and then I said, and by the way, codependent is kind of a hack word because of blah, blah, blah. And I explained why. And then I said, and while we're on the topic, I should also say that the, the phrase commit suicide is also not the preferred nomenclature. Now we say killing yourself or completed suicide because committed suicide implies a sin or a crime and and that doesn't seem like the way we want to talk about suicide and and then i i you know start moved on with class and then someone raised their hand and they said so is it is it a hack thing to say if you say red flag you know that's that raises some red flags um and i and i said oh i don't think so not not in my opinion and i suddenly realized that i had created kind of a problem by calling out certain words that might seem quite natural to these students to be labeled by me anyway as evidence that they're a hack therapist. Now, these are, you know, second quarter graduate students or second week graduate students, meaning they've they've only been in graduate school for about seven days. And so, you know, they're insecure. They want to impress. They they want to do well. And they don't want to come across as a, like a hack. And here I am, you know, jumping down people's throats about saying words, you know, that come across as, as like a hack, even though to them it's, it seems like extremely accurate and normal words to use. And so later on, I sent out an email and I just said, look, uh, if, if, if you have anything to say about my my hack pet peeve words, feel free to email me and yell at me about it. I, you know, I, I, you know, uh, I'm open to feedback, <laughs> but I also, it also sparked this topic in my mind of what are all the hack things that therapists say that I hear often, you know, what are the most common things that I hear therapists say, or graduate students say for that matter, that indicates that they're a hack therapist or that they are amateurish. Now I'm using the phrase hack therapist ex- in an exaggerated form it's not like if I heard a therapist say the word codependent, I would automatically think they're a terrible therapist. It's being a quality therapist is mostly independent of the usage of what these, what I'll call hack terms. Being a therapist is extremely complicated. Graduate school is way too short. I mean, even though graduate school full-time, two or three, four years of education, of intense graduate school education, it's just not enough time. There's too much to learn. There's too many little nuances. And I often say that 99% of what I've learned about this field, I have learned outside of graduate school. A lot of what I've learned about this profession has been doing this podcast. And so there's just a lot to learn. And, and especially when you're at the beginning of your career, you're really trying to act like you know what you're doing. And you're really trying to come across like you're competent you're trying to stave off any kind of criticism or any kind of noticing that you're terrified and you don't know what you're doing. And so there's just a lot of uh, issues there. But anyway, so I thought I would do an episode in which I just listed 15. So I, I just sat down and made a list and I, and I came up with 15 different things that I see novice therapists or students do that indicate to me that they need to change that. <laughs> it's a nicer way to put it, um, you know, but in my mind, I honestly think, oh, that that's a hacky word that that person used. I hope you understand what I mean by hack. You know, like 
amateurish is a synonym, I suppose. So I thought I would just list those out. So let's get into it. What do you say? Um, this is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. I'm going to read one of these. It's going to be codependent. I'm going to go into detail. It's, it's got quite a story behind it. But the other 14 is only going to be available to patrons. So if, if you're interested in hearing the whole episode, you have to become a patron of the podcast. I'll explain that later. So anyway, let's go into codependent. So the most important criterion for the label of codependency is when someone enables another person to engage in the destructive behavior that they're into, like alcohol use, or um, you can enable, or you can be codependent by enabling someone to not move out of your house, like, you know, with an adult child, or if someone isn't working, you can enable that and and some people will apply the label that you're codependent or if someone has gambling problems or anger issues and that the family member enables that behavior to happen sometimes uh, the label of codependent will be used in situations like this other characteristics that have been identified and i should say that codependency is not a clinical term it's more of a a term that is in the uh, addiction world um, so it's, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a mental health clinical term, but anyway, the, but the other characteristics that are often cited are uh, being defined by someone else's larger personality and behavior. Um, you know, a codependent person not only enables their spouse or their family member to continue with the destructive behavior like drinking or anger issues, but they also define themselves through that problematic person, uh, you know, usually because of childhood mistreatment, right? Uh, childhood, childhood mistreatment, as I often talk about on the podcast, can lead to a lack of self, um, a lack of self-preservation, a comfort with chaos, reliance on approval. And this can lead someone potentially coping with those difficulties by becoming a people pleaser, um, by finding someone else to control, by finding someone else who exhibits, um, you know, issues with their life so that you can take care of them or even criticize them as a way of distracting you from your own issues. So I hope that makes sense to, uh, about codependency. But let's look into the history of, co of codependency. So we have to go back to 1935 when Alcoholics Anonymous was formed. And in the beginning, for the first number of decades of Alcoholics, Alcoholics Anonymous, they, they mainly focused on individuals who were struggling with alcohol use. So they didn't focus on the family members very much. They, it was very much like, we need to help the alcoholic to not be, you know, to not drink anymore, to go through the 12 steps and all that kind of thing. Then skip forward all the way to, to 1970s, and this is when family therapy and family systems theory started to influence uh, all areas within mental health, including the treatment of alcoholism. And those who specialized in alcoholism, they found that when they looked at the family, they found that the spouse of or another family member of the alcoholic would often interfere with recovery and sobriety. And it seemed surprising because when someone is drinking all the time and their life is falling apart, it would make sense that the family members and their spouses and people around them would want them to recover. You know, if, if you, if your wife is drinking all the time and, you know, having all sorts of problems, it makes sense that you would want your wife to stop drinking. Right. And certainly that was true, but they all, but what these family therapists and systems oriented people within chemical dependency, what they started seeing was that these family members strangely would do things to kind of sabotage the recovery of the alcoholic. And so this was very much in line with systems theory in that we don't look at problems in individuals, we have to look at problems in families as a whole and in society as a whole. That you can't just look at an individual's behavior and treat the individual, you have to actually look at the whole system. And so these systemic thinkers, these family therapist people, they found that um, there were a number of odd behaviors specifically that they would find in spouses and other family members of the alcoholic. For example, they might find that a spouse might actually encourage the alcoholic to drink, even though the alcoholic has stopped drinking. 
because they're in recovery and AA or some other chemical dependency situation. Um, like they might come to the recovering alcoholic and, and say, you know, why did you quit drinking? You were so much more fun back when you were drinking before, you know, why'd you quit? So this is a criticism of their sobriety and, and, Odd, particularly you know, by the time someone enters treatment for alcoholism, they've probably had a, a you know number of years of difficulty with it, and so it, it it seemed weird to the systemic treaters of of the alcoholic that these spouses would sort of work against sobriety. It just seemed weird. Uh, or a family member might shame the alcoholic, you know, to, to you know, it's like oh, you're a piece of shit or something as a way of trying to manipulate the alcoholic to drink again, because alcoholics will often drink when they're ashamed of themselves. Shame, you know, what people in chemical dependency will often say is shame is the main driver of addiction. Or a codependent spouse might subtly make the alcoholic feel terrible about themselves by putting themselves down. By, by putting the alcoholic down, you know, it might be like, oh, you're so stupid or, you know, I don't know, you don't know how to do anything right or that kind of thing, which can be a subtle way of manipulating an, a recovering alcoholic to drink again. And the list went on and on and on. These people started observing all sorts of things. And they were just like, wow, we can't just treat the alcoholic. We have to also treat the family members because if we just treat the alcoholic and the alcoholic goes, the recovered alcoholic, the sober alcoholic goes back home, then they're, uh, they're likely to relapse again just because we're ignoring the broader picture of the problem here, with namely the, the family and most notably the quote unquote codependent. And so they started calling the, these people who were uh, these problematic other individuals that were close to the alcoholic, they started calling them co-alcoholic, you know, like a co-pilot. So they would, they would lay, it was often their spouse. So they would say they would, you know, your spouse is the co-alcoholic and they would go to the spouse and they would call them, you are the co-alcoholic, meaning that uh, it was a, it was a word that they used to try to emphasize the fact that the spouses and the enabling family members, they're not off the hook. They're not, they don't just have a family member with an alcohol problem. They are also part of the problem and they need to take responsibility for that. And they need to start problem solving around how they interact and how they think and how they relate to other people as it relates to the alcoholics issue. And so this co-alcoholic, you know, they're not just calling it, you're not just the spouse of the, you're, you're, you're actually just, you know, you're the co-pilot. Um, and so uh, they, that, that's the term that they would use. Um, so skipping forward to the 1980s, this is when drug addiction became more of an issue in our society. Perhaps it was a more prevalent, but perhaps it was just more paid attention to. And treatment programs started, uh, you know, realizing that they could actually treat drug addiction too. They didn't just treat alcoholism. They're like, look, someone's addicted to cocaine or heroin or, or even gambling or something like this. We can actually treat those as well because our model seems to work with, with these other folks as well. So they, call, they started using the term chemical dependency instead of alcoholism or, you know, or drug dependency. It's like, well, let's just, let's just call it chemical dependency because that it's a catch all phrase for everything, for all substances. And that term has retained till today, 2019. So instead of calling the, you know, the two people, the alcoholic and the co-alcoholic, they would call the person, the, you know, someone who was chemically dependent and the the co-alcoholic they changed to co-chemically dependent. But that's kind of a long term, right? Co-chemically dependent, you know. Co-alcoholics is much easier to say than co-chemically dependent. So they so they just shortened it to codependent. So that's when we first started seeing the term codependent. So so I hope for those of you who didn't know where this term comes from, I hope you understand now why I would be bothered by this term being used so broadly for so many different things. Because people often use this word codependent as a word for dependency, and I'll get into that later. But really, codependent is very specific. It is a individual who is very close to someone who is suffering from chemical dependency, 
who does things that enables or encourages or somehow participates in the problem along with the person who has the chemical dependency. And, and it's not even really a personality type. Because the, the other thing to point out is that when you are, you know, take a perfectly, take the most healthy person on the planet and put them in a marriage with someone who has a pretty good uh, case pretty strong case of chemical dependency. No matter how healthy you are, no matter how hard you try, you will start doing codependent things because you love that person. And it sort of forces you into that situation. You know, like just as an example, let's say you're married with kids and you're, you know, you're pretty healthy and your spouse drinks every day, you know, just starts drinking at noon and drinks until the night, until the evening doesn't get super drunk, but sometimes overdoses a little bit and becomes a little slurry in speech. Well, you've tried talking with the alcoholic spouse about it. You've tried saying, hey, you know, I, I, this is a problem. Like, why are you doing this all the time? And the alcoholic spouse is like, oh, yeah, you know, I need to stop. I, I really do. And they try to quit, and maybe they quit for a few days, and then they, you know, they fall off the wagon again and they struggle and and it's years of this where it's like oh you're right i need to stop and they try to stop and then eventually they're just like they're so shameful about their use they're just like fuck it i'm just gonna drink and i don't and i because it's so hard to quit it maybe the person has been traumatized in their life they've been they've been untreated for that and so they just sort of give up and, and they're just they just sort of hand their personality over to the alcohol because it to them it feels like the only way they can cope and as a spouse, you're watching this and you love this person and you want them to stop, but you see how hard it is. And when you bring it up, the alcoholic person might get a little touchy around it, right? They might be like, you know what? Get off my back. Stop talking about this. And you sort of learn over time. It's like, okay, I, I probably shouldn't bring up this issue because it seems to be pretty, pretty ingrained, pretty uh, stable, and now I'm at the point, I'm 10 years, 15 years into this relationship. We've got kids together. Our lives are intertwined. I do love my spouse, but at the same time, I, I really want things to change. I go to friends to talk about it. They say to leave my spouse, but I don't want to do that. Or they say, just put your foot down. And, and I'm like, I feel like I've already done that. And then so you're in this conundrum. And then let's say your spouse drinks too much the night before, is hungover in the morning, and can't make it to work, and is passed out, completely just passed out, and won't wake up. And you're worried that your spouse is going to lose their job. Well, what do you do? You know, you're in that situation. Now, to some on the outside, they're just like, well, just divorce the person and move on with your life. And look, you know, if, if that's your point of view, you're either too young to have experienced enough messiness in life, or I don't know what your deal is, but life is too complicated uh, to make such simple calls in life. You know, every relationship has its problems, and it's a matter of pros and cons. Anyway, the point is, is that you're in that situation, your spouse is passed out in the bed, they're not waking up, you realize they're going to miss work, and what do you do? You could do nothing and risk your spouse getting fired. You could call the office and say, I'm sorry, but my spouse is super hungover and probably isn't going to make it to work. And that could lead to, uh, you know, political problems at work for your spouse or maybe even being fired or retribution from your spouse, frankly, or more drinking from your spouse because you know that the more shameful your spouse feels, the more likely they are to drink. Or you can call the work and say, I'm really sorry, but my spouse is really sick right now and can't make it into work. And that's what a lot of people do. And guess what? In the chemical dependency world, that's called enabling. That's called codependent behavior. You are now enabling this spouse to continue to drink uh, and you are buffering consequences for that person. Essentially, creating the problem. But you understand that when you lay out life and in, in the way it really goes, it's not like you wake up in the morning and you're like, okay, I'm going to cause more problems in my life and in my family's life. No, you're just making little decisions based on anxiety in the moment and based on what you have available to you. And, 
And then, so your spouse wakes up and says, oh my God, I missed work. And you say, look, I called work. I said you were sick. Well, now you've set up this pattern where now your spouse is like, huh, okay, well, that was, thank you so much for doing that. And then the, the, spou- the drinking spouse eventually drinks to, you know, is starting to drink to, to excess and thinks, well, you know, my, my spouse will call my work in the morning if I get too drunk. And so I, I could probably, and the, then it just gets worse and worse and worse. So every little step down the road eventually, you know, allows the alcoholic or the person suffering from addiction to get worse and worse and worse. And so this is codependency. This is enabling. So that is codependency. It's quite different than dependency, which is a personality trait or even a personality disorder. So in the 80s, this word of codependent emerged as a way to acknowledge the, you know, the family member or the person close to the chemically dependent person uh, in terms of what they needed to change and that kind of thing. Then in 1986, Melanie Beattie popularized the concept of codependency with the book Codependent No More. Some of you older folks or people in chemical dependency might know this book. It's a quite famous book, Codependent No More. And it, at the time, in the late 80s, early 90s, it was a very popular book, particularly for women who had alcoholic or uh, husbands who had struggled, struggled with addiction. Um, and codependency, after this point, after this book and lots of other talk, the term codependency became very popular. Um, people started really taking to it. And they started to apply the term codependency to a lot of other situations, not just the family members of people who have a, a, an addiction problem. Like they started using codependent as a term for people who have abusive spouses or people who have controlling spouses or people who have avoidant family members or something. And like I said earlier, uh, it is sometimes like if you have a child who is 27 years old and plays video games all day and never leaves the house, sometimes people will, and you're, and you're seemingly enabling that behavior. uh, Some people will label you as codependent. So it really started to become broad And then um, there were even more books published on it and a lot more claims were made and other claims like it was a, people were saying it's a personality disorder. And this led to the concept being somewhat mainstream within the field of psychotherapy because it was so popular, sort of bled into our professional field. For example, some researchers tried to get codependency included in the latest DSM in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. They wanted codependency to be a personality disorder, but it was rejected um, because there was a lack of empirical evidence for the most part. And, and also, I would guess that um, most r- serious researchers at the time, they looked down on chemical dependency workers and this term codependency comes from the chemical dependency world. And so, you know, serious, you know, psychiatrists are the ones mainly who write the DSM. I'm pretty sure it's psychiatrists. I mean, it's the American Psychiatric Association. I'd have to look at the, the notes to see. Anyway, the point is, is that, um, you know, uh, researchers in psychology and psychiatry are the people who write the DSM. And historically speaking in our field, there's been a, a sort of elitism of looking down on other professions. Like my profession of marriage and family therapy is often looked down on because we, we came new on the scene in the 80s and 90s. And so we're considered like new kids on the block, so to speak, and uh, therefore sub, um, substandard to old school uh, fields. Uh, and chemical dependency has been looked down on. Um, it's still looked down on today, by the way. And so I suspect that it was rejected from the DSM because of that reason. Um, and also around this time, people started throwing around the word codependency in all sorts of ways. And it, in my estimation, it was this time when it started to morph from the original definition to a broader term of just being a synonym for dependency. Like when you're dependent, you can't go to the store by yourself or you have a really hard time with your self-esteem unless someone else makes you feel better or 
you're extremely anxious making decisions on your own, or you always need advice before taking a step forward. Um, and the, the list goes on and on. I, and, and I've done a, a whole deep dive that was just for patrons on passive aggressive personality disorder, and which is very close to dependent personality disorder. So become a patron and you can have access to that. I, that's probably a number of hours, a long episode. But anyway, so I hope you get the difference between codependency, the true definition of it, and dependent personality disorder. So again, people started using codependency as a stand-in for dependent personality disorder. Then there was this big backlash in our field. I, I think because the term was being used quite haphazardly in society and also in our field. And in my uh, speculation, in my observation, anything that becomes popular in the wider culture that is uh, something within our field immediately becomes suspect to those within our field. Like, multiple personalities, the multiple personality disorder or manic depression, these things became very popular terms in the 80s and 90s. And people started throwing them around all the time. You know, that person has multiple personality disorder. That person has manic depression. Well, the, they became so popular that they, people started to distort these terms. They started to bastardize these terms in society. And again, this is just my narrative. But I think that uh, our field and, and those in control of the, of the terms, they're like, we need, to, we need to get control of this disorder away from popular culture because popular culture is ruining it for us. They're applying it too broadly. They don't understand it. And so they changed multiple personality disorder to dissociative identity disorder. They changed manic depression to bipolar. Now, multiple personality disorder kind of makes sense why they changed it because it's not actually different personalities. It's actually different alters that come forward. The person has one personality, but that's kind of a semantic thing, right? It's, it's not that big of a deal to say that people with DID or dissociative identity disorder have multiple personalities. I know there's quite a debate about that. But the other one is really quite, you know, silly to me. It's like originally it was called manic depression and then they called it bipolar, which is essentially in essence the same term, right? So why would you change in manic depression that totally fits the term, right? I mean, I don't know the exact history on why they changed it, but but it's interesting that other terms in the DSM don't get changed even though they probably should be changed probably because they're not garnering a lot of public attention. But anyway, so I think at this time, uh, codependency was being bastardized in a lot of ways. And our field was just like, we, we've got to, you know, we've got to wrestle control away from these people. So some researchers started looking into the concept. They're like, okay, there's a lot of claims being made by a lot of pop psychology authors. Let's actually look into the claims that are being made about codependency. Um, because because at this point, codependent, authors in codependency were expanding the term to, inc to include a lot of different personality traits and a lot of different pseudoscientific claims were being made about it and all this kind of stuff. And the researchers found that the construct of codependency didn't really hold together under empirical observation. I could go into detail on this. It's quite complicated as to how our field actually legitimizes or delegitimizes different constructs. But just believe me when I say that codependency was found to not really, the way it was being broadly used, it didn't really make any sense, particularly as a personality type. You know, because I, like I said earlier, you can push someone into a, into codependent behavior, even though they don't have a personality disorder, by the nature of the their circumstances, right? They're just sort of they, they're just sort of reacting normally to a very difficult situation. It's not a, it's not necessarily indicative of their personality. So this is similar to Type A personality. I did a whole episode on Type A personality. This is another term that is bastardized by society people like oh i'm type a personality and the when you actually look at the personality traits that are associated with type a personality and you actually try to find these personality types among 
a, you know, a population of people, you, you don't find it. These, these traits don't fit together. So the whole construct of type A personality doesn't make any sense. I mean, I guess just to demonstrate this, imagine if I were to write a book and I claimed that there was, you know, type X personality and I threw together just out of my own machinations or experiences or storytelling to myself that there was a, a, a certain kind of individual with type X personality who was aggressive and also loved nature and also liked to smell paper in the morning and liked to put their keys into their ear and loved YouTube videos about popping zits. Like if I just said type X personality involves these people, I hope you understand that in all likelihood, those five characteristics don't fit together. <laughs> they don't correlate. And so th that's what type A personality and codependency was doing. There were authors just kind of throwing together all these different traits that weren't actually correlated with each other and didn't cluster together into a, a, a type of person. And so researchers were like, okay, we've decided codependency is, is BS as a personality disorder. You could absolutely look at codependent behavior, like I said earlier, like there's codependent behavior that some people engage in, but, you know, a lot of people love to yell at football games, you know, they're screaming at the ref or whatever, but you don't necessarily label that a personality disorder. We don't have to put that in the DSM. You're just like, well, that's a behavior. It might be associated with something. I don't know. But codependent behavior seemingly isn't correlated with any kind of personality in a strong enough way that we need to have this construct in the DSM called codependency. Um, so that was that. And we thought, well, okay, we've decided as a field, let's, let's get rid of codependency. Let's, it's, let's use other terms here like dependency or maybe codependent behavior, enabling behavior or something, but let's, let's get rid of that word. Cause it's, it's really being overused and it's, it doesn't make any empirical sense. Regardless of this, the term continued to be used because it had already infiltrated the society at large and us as people in the psychological field, we are so terrible at communicating to the wider public that most people who have used the term codependency wrongly have never heard anyone say otherwise. They've never heard from us in an effective manner, stop using that term. It's, you're not using it right. There's another term that's much more specific and accurate to our field, which is just the, you just have to take the co off. Just, just use the word co, just use the word dependency. Um, and it really drives me nuts. You know, there, whenever I hear the word codependent, I would say 99% of the time they're using it wrong. It's like the way people are using the word literally today. If you're one of those people who doesn't like it when people are using the word literally in a, in a wrong, what they actually mean is figuratively or actually, and they're actually saying the word literally in a, in a literally wrong way. <laughs> um, if you're one of those people who doesn't like that shift in our culture and would like to retain the meaning of words and, you know, words mean something to you, then you can relate to what I am going through when I hear people using the word codependent in a wrong way. Now, having said all that, anyone who knows anything about linguistics and history and society understands that language morphs over time. And maybe in 20 years, literally in the dictionary will actually have a completely different definition, perhaps the opposite definition as it does today. Uh, language changes over time. There's nothing wrong with that. And I, every word that I'm saying right now is a product of that process. So I'm okay with that. However, if, I'm, if I go to a clinician and say, by the way, do you know the definition of codependency? And they're like, uh, I guess I don't. Then I say, well, here's the definition. And they're like, oh, I guess I should stop using that word. Then that's different, right? That's, that's um, to me, it's like if you're a clinician and you're learning the language of your field, it, there's, there's a, we can't just 
allow things to drift away from their original meanings. Unless we as a, as a field decide to say, look, let's just use the word codependency interchangeably with the word dependency. You know, if as a field we come together and say that, then I'll go along with that. I'm, I'm cool with consensus, but no one is saying that. No one has ever said that as far as I know. Everyone who knows the terms dependency and codependence, codependency in our field know that these are drastically different things, and codependency is a really quite specific thing that most people don't really understand what it is. Anyway, so clinicians use this term, and my students, like my student a few days ago, used the word codependent, and it because it's this word is just totally infiltrated our society. So, you know, like an example of people using this word incorrectly would be like. Oh my God, she's so codependent. She can't do anything by herself. I'm sure you out there have heard people use codependency in this way, or you've even said it before. And again, just to remind you, codependency is the process of being a uh, close person to someone who has chemical dependency who enables that or is part of the problem. That's, if, so if you want to use codependency in that way, like, oh my God, she's so codependent, she enables her husband to drink all the time. Then I'd be like, oh, nice, you used the word correctly. <laughs> but if you're saying, oh my God, this person can't do anything by herself, then the word you want to use is dependency. And think of all the calories you'll save, all the energy you'll save by not having to use that extra syllable of co. So that's why whenever I hear the term codependency or codependent from a clinician and they're using it wrongly, according to my ears, I immediately think they're a hack. <laughs> now, I don't think that they're a terrible therapist necessarily or a terrible person for sure, but I think they have, they've, you know, if they're making a mistake regarding that word, what other mistakes are they making and what other holes in their competency exist? Um, I, you know, it's a quick, just fleeting judgment that I will make of someone. I, you know, I, I would never just write someone off if they use the word codependent. Um, if if that if if I did that, I'd probably write off seventy five percent of the therapists that I know. So, um, you know, but I but I will tell you that when I hear that word from somebody, I, I immediately think, oh and they're using it wrongly, I'm just like, oh boy, you know, you, how, you probably need to hit the books because you're not using that word right. Um, and I, I guess as I'm thinking about this, I'm a bit of a stickler when it comes to personality disorders in general. If you haven't noticed, <laughs> a number of episodes that I make are about being somewhat pedantic and protective of our Fields definition of different personality disorders, even protecting these definitions and conceptualizations and constructs from other clinicians, probably most, most clinicians, you know, I, I go on YouTube sometimes and I see clinicians throwing around narcissistic personality disorder in a way that indicates to me, they do not understand what that personality disorder is. And which makes sense to me because personality disorders are very difficult to understand. But at the same time, it's like, Hey, I don't mind if lay people use these terms wrong because of course they would because why would they understand these things? You know, I, I, I'm not enthusiastic about it, but it, it stands to reason that they don't understand things in our field, particularly complex things like personality disorders. But if you're in our field, you know, before you say something, you know, just make sure that you know what you're talking about. And, and a little bit of knowledge can lead to the Dunning-Kruger effect, right? which can lead to you thinking that you know what you're talking about when you really don't, right? Now, I'm sure, I'm, I'm, uh, in fact, I catch myself so sometimes doing this too, so I'm not saying I'm above it at all, and I'm mortified when I do things like this, but I, I guess I have a principle that if I don't really know something, I'm going to at least give the caveat that I don't know what I'm talking about, or, I, or I'm not confident in what I'm saying. You know, if, if I start talking about uh, politics, for example, I hope that I often will say something like, look, I'm a lay person when it comes to politics. There are people who study politics their entire lives. And I'm sure if I say anything related to politics within three words into my statement, a expert will look at me and, th and, and say, oh, 
honey, you really just don't know what you're talking about. You know, God bless you for trying, but you know, you really have a simplistic or mistake, common mistaken understanding of how politics works. And I get that. So I don't know why I'm going down this rabbit hole, but anyway, so I, that's why I want to, so that's why I want to talk about uh, hacky things that therapists will do. I have 14 other things, but uh, those are for patrons only. So if you want to hear those 14 things, go to patreon.com and become a patron of the podcast. When you become a patron, you get access to hundreds of patron exclusive episodes, including this one in which we do deep dives into ver various topics. And when you become a patron, you don't have to listen to the vast majority of commercials in all likelihood. And also remember that a portion of your monthly pledge goes towards various charities that we support.